You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. Use flamethrower, Will. <laughs> <laughs> and hello, listeners. Welcome to Spooky. Spooky 2023. We're back. For it, the, it's October. It's October for the Halloween season. Yep. We are back to discuss monsters. Spooky is one of our favorite side series. Yep. Spookulative evolution. Where we look at popular monsters in myth, media, legend, and say, okay, based on the features described, what would it take to evolve something that's similar, that has most of those features, that elicits the stories that looks like the creatures we come to know and love in all these stories. So we are going to take a look again at a new set of monsters. This year's group? We're doing dragons. This year's dragons. <laughs> Finally. But yeah, this was this has been a long time coming. <laughs> We've had dragons on the the list since the beginning. Absolutely. Of eventually, of course. And then just every time we come around, we're like, well, not yet. Not, not yet. Not this uh, year. Yeah. And then finally, it, it had to be this year. <laughs> it's Dragons. We will be using the toolkit of real world evolution and natural selection to speculate on how we could evolve dragons. Absolutely. Now, this is by no means meant to be a definitive argument for how dragons definitely could have happened or the right way to do dragons right. nor to overshadow the thousand of other yes. discussions that have been done on this same very topic. Absolutely. This is just our idea of looking at the history of earth and the life that's been on it, which group would likely give rise to something similar to dragons and why, what would cause it to become that way. So we will go into that. Now dragons, I don't think needs as much of an intro as some of our other Monsters have in the past. I've heard of them. <laughs> we are in a room filled with dragons because we are recording in my room. Uh, <laughs> and for this series, we will actually be looking at some distinct types of dragons. So there are endless lists of varieties of dragons. We have picked some types and we will be going through these different varieties that we've selected. Uh, we Actually, I have a member of every single one that we will be doing in this room. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> every single one is represented in here. And we will be releasing those episodes every Saturday in October. Four episodes, as usual. Mm hmm And then we have a little bit of extra this year. We are going to do a live stream. A spooky live stream. Yes. On November 11th at 3 p.m., we will be doing a live stream to discuss this year's season of spooky and... and have some Q&A and discussion about what we created. Yeah, we know that our audience loves the speculative evolution topic. We know that we can never cover all the ideas or address all of the things. So we'll be doing a public live stream. It'll be on YouTube. Anybody can join and chat speculative evolution with yeah. us. So check the description for the website link. You can get details there if you need the specifics. But without further ado, that's all of our intro. We can jump in. The first episode's topic is going to be European dragons. Dragons that drink tea and <laughs> uh, dress nicely. Absolutely. <laughs> European dragons. Also, I've seen them called classic dragons. Yep. Also, this is what you think of when you think of medieval dragons and knights. Mm -hmm. The typical four legs, two wings on the back, long neck, long tail, heavily armored often with claws, and then a toothy reptilian head with horns, typically. The most popular form of dragon we see in, like, most media that portrays them fighting heroes. Right. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. This is the dragons that knights fight. These, mm -hmm. This is the very popular form of dragon, especially in Western media. By far. Which is why European, this is a form that shows up in a lot of different European countries. And it is not the only dragon in European mythology. We'll talk a little bit about that. But that is where we'll be starting with that. And these dragons go back a long ways. Uh, now, European dragons go back even further before we have a form that fully matches that, or before this form is popular. This form does show up kind of multiple times, and some of them may be inspirations for later incarnations. Most of the early European dragons were actually very serpentine. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll hear that. They'll be called serpents, and they yes. will be referred to as basically just giant snakes. And sometimes they have extra features, sometimes they have extra abilities, but 
for the most part, dragons in Europe, in the West, started as monstrous snakes. That was the most common form for them. Mm -hmm. One of the earliest, though, like stories that includes things that we would call dragons and have been referred to as dragons goes back to Mesopotamia with the Sumerians, some of earliest human recorded history. In their mythologies, in their uh, pantheon of gods, there was Tiamat. Mm -hmm. This is where Tiamat comes from before it was made popular nowadays by Dungeons and Dragons with the five-headed yep. chaos god. <laughs> Tiamat was the Mesopotamian goddess, was the, supposed to be like the source of all salt water. There's another companion god that was the source of all fresh water. And she is often referred to as the mother of monsters. Not the mother of dragons. Yes. That's a different person. Yes. Technically, she is mother of some dragons, but sure, she's also sure. mother of lots of other monsters too. Right. In the myth that leads to her creating a bunch of monsters, she gives birth to 11 different kinds of monsters. And it's kind of, you know, there's different types. And it sounds like sometimes these are individuals. Sometimes it's categories of monster that were created. But some of these include these monstrous serpents and ostensibly dragons. Uh, there were three horned snakes that had very dragon-esque features that we see show up in a lot of later things. Now, some of these names I, I, I'm going to mess up because these are uh, Mesopotamian names and I don't know how they're pronounced. Apologies. Apologies up front. Uh, there's three horned snakes that are supposed to be, I think, siblings. Bashmu, the venomous snake, which was a horned snake with two front legs and wings. Okay. So a legged winged serpent. Musmahu, the exalted or distinguished serpent which was a hybrid of serpent, lion, and bird. They didn't specify which parts of each, right. but features of those so three. Pick your favorites. And sometimes identified as a seven-headed serpent. And then there was Ushumgalu, the great dragon, is what I found it named as, you know, in its translation, which was usually described as a lion dragon demon with four legs and wings on the back. Okay. And there's, like, Mesopotamian art, and it basically looks like a, you know, crude lion body with wings attached and like a little bit more of a dragonish or like embellished face and some things i saw connected this to that later form of dragon mm -hmm. but i also found one description of one of her children mushusu the furious serpent which the description i found was a scaly animal hind legs resembling the talons of an eagle four limbs of a lion long neck and tail Horned head with a crest and snake-like tongue. A, that's a that's sounds a like dragon. a medieval <laughs> right? style dragon. So also very manticore. Yes, sounding. Yes, and that's a theme with a lot of dragons is that they have a lot of different features of different animals. Mm -hmm. Sometimes explicitly said to have the body of this, the legs of that. Yeah. Other times, just you know, they are a amalgamation, a chimera mm -hmm. of animal parts that have been put together for this new monster. It is likely that a number of these, or one of these, of Tiamat's children gave rise to the concept of dragon, you know, and that type of monster. Probably a, a combination of them, even. In Greek and Roman history, we see a lot of dragons, typically serpentine. And theirs were often just great snakes. Right. Just full on a big snake. Sometimes having venomous breath, you know, and described crushing things in their coils. Uh, they were also, interestingly, not always evil. They were good, neutral, evil. They had a variety of temperaments. The word dragon does come from a Greek origin of draconta, which evidently means to watch. Hmm. And one thing I saw speculate that maybe that's having to do with them watching over treasure, because very often in the stories, yeah. they were guardians of something, something yeah. valuable. And that is very often the role they play in a lot of Greek stories. We've actually described, uh, we visited the, these kinds of stories before with the Hydra, which is often yep. considered to be a Greek dragon guarding the Golden Fleece in Jason and the Argonauts movie, but guarding <laughs> uh, the swamp and killed by Heracles. There's Python, which was another dragon, just that was its name, Python. Yep, just Python. Which guarded the Oracle Delphi. And then Ladon was a hundred headed dragon that guarded the tree of Hes Hesperides. Which was also killed by Heracles. Uh, hmm. Python was killed by Apollo, though. So This is, seems like it's going to be a common theme. Dragons getting killed by heroes. Which is something I've seen pointed out about dragons. Yeah, and again, European dragons, mm -hmm. sort of our focus for this episode, especially yes. that this is the knights fighting dragons kind of dragon. And 
dragons, uh, I've seen it pointed out as a actually unusual feature of dragons compared to other mythical monsters. Their role in stories is to be defeated by a hero. Mm -hmm. A lot of other monsters would talk with humans, would have interactions, like fairies and... Right, right, and, sphinxes, mm -hmm. things like that. They were there as part of the story, but they weren't always to be combated. Mm -hmm. You know, there are plenty of other monsters that have been slain and, and defeated, but often other monsters were just, you know, tricked or survived, you know, that, that you just made it out of right. their trap. Skilla and Charybdis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just, you make it. Exactly. You get past them. So dragons are kind of unusual in that their role in most stories is to be conquered by the hero. Mm -hmm. And that that's kind of a, a notable thing about the European dragon. Another interesting thing about a lot of European interpretations of dragons, going back to Greek and Roman and continuing on, is that they were often described as factual. You know, described in, at that time actually educational material of right. this was meant to be taken as a description here, of an animal here there be dragons yes is here is what the dragons of india are like mm -hmm. and i'm now just telling you about an animal and that was actually the indian dragon was a very common concept talked about by a number of intellectuals during this time and they were almost always described sometimes called draco or dracon with a k instead of a g were often described as giant constricting snakes Hmm. most likely the Indian python, but very consistently said to be able to kill an elephant by constricting its neck. Like that was the the noted behavior. Interesting. Which is, you know, a great exaggeration, but sure. is noting the constricting ability of those snakes and that they took on large prey. So it may have just been an embellishment to get the point across mm -hmm. in that time. But that battle between elephant and dragon was really common. Huh. In lots of stories, they were enemies of each other. And there's many, many references to them doing battle or hating one another or the only animal that the other fears. Like, I've just, I've read bestiary entries before. And yeah, it's just, be like, here's the dragon. Also, by the way, they hate elephants. Moving on. Interesting. And I don't know what the, if, you know, what the exact history of that is. It might just be that. Well, if you want to make an animal impressive... Yeah, that's this is the biggest thing around. You pit it against an elephant. The right. most impressive animal we know of. <laughs> this was described by multiple you know, famous uh, uh, authors in the time. Pliny the Elder, who was considered one of the first naturalists, wrote this in his Natural History, uh, the book Natural History. That's what it was called. Uh, one example of that pitting against is a concept of dragon's blood, which was a resin from a fruit of the dragon's blood tree, which was once a, a medicinal ingredient and it was described by plenty of the elder to be formed when dragons attacked elephants and their blood mixed together and ran into the ground and congealed uh so it's it's this concept of them being mighty animals fighting other mighty animals that was yeah. a very common concept during that time interesting you would also get other descriptions uh i found one from a, a greek scholar philostratus and a lot of these are in the the third to second century bce and the first to second century AD, so like long time ago, that described mountain dragons and that they had scales of golden color and bushy beards that was also golden hmm. and eyes that sunk into their eyebrows and emit a terrible and ruthless glance and that they were longer than plains dragons. Inter that, that, that natural history mm -hmm. aspect of them is very interesting. Yes, we are in a time period where very much we kind of took them seriously even though there were still fantastical stories. Uh, this is also the time period where the concept of dragon's teeth comes from, that if you slayed, sl slew a dragon and collected its teeth and then planted them in the ground, each would rise a soldier ready to fight for you. Hmm. Uh, this is shown in the movie Jason and the Argonauts when they take the teeth of the Hydra and a bunch of skeletal warriors come out. And one of the coolest stop motion fights ever. Gotcha. Uh, but this this showed up in actually different stories, uh, different versions of the Jason and, and King of Thebes stories. We then see dragons take on a lot of different attributes, some of which we're more familiar with when Christianity took a hold of them. When Christianity mm. came into the scene, they started using dragons as a metaphor for Satan. Okay. And that's sure, when sure. dragons became evil incarnate. Right. Yeah. Plagues the, on the land. The serpent. The serpent. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They were. This is when they started taking young maidens and demanding sacrifice uh, and terrorizing in villages. The highest room in the tallest yeah. tower. In a lot of the Greek stories, the dragon's not coming to the hero. Right. The hero goes and kills the dragon to take what they're guarding. Right. So it's here that we start seeing them become plagues on the common people. Yeah. 
It is also noted that a lot of the monsters in the Bible are very dragon-esque. We mm-hmm. talked about the Leviathan in our Sea Monsters episode. Yep. And it's described as being scaled and armored and flames emitting from its mouth. Yep. Like, very much, if you just described Leviathan, people would say it was a dragon. And we started seeing them create legends of saints and bishops slaying dragons and defeating dragons, often with the sign of the cross and with mm-hmm. their their holy superiority over this this evil beast the most famous being saint george the dragon slayer this is that famous image of the knight on the horseback with a lance going down into the dragon that's coiling around it Mm -hmm. that famous famous medieval painting this is a story that actually is a pre-christian story but saint george one is what made the story popular so the original versions date back before but the story becoming a christian story is when it became super popular and part of the story is he Finds a town being terrorized by a dragon that demands a sacrifice every day of a virgin maiden and a sheep, I think, or goat. Sure. Livestock. And when St. George sees the dragon coming for the maiden, does battle with it, stabs it with his lance, and then demands that the town convert to Christianity So if they want him to kill it. And they right. do, and he slays the dragon. That Yep, sounds about right. <laughs> yep. So this is when we see dragons take on that very much of conquering evil. Yeah. They they were a thing to not be just, overcome. Not just a monster, yeah. but a incarnation of evil. Beforehand, they were just kind of a step on the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Now it is good versus evil. Interesting. And this is very much the dragon that goes into a lot of the medieval stories that we're so familiar with. Each European nation had slightly different takes on the dragons. There's a bunch of different kinds. One of the earliest stories of this area and of that time is famous. the famous story of Beowulf. Yep. Has a dragon in it. In that one, it is referred to either as dragon or draca, sometimes worm with a Y, uh, but also just worm with an O or serpent. It breeds fire, it flew, it lived underground, it collected treasure. All of that stuff is now really established in the dragon mythos very often. It said that no legs or wings are mentioned, but it can fly. So it's never described as being serpentine, but... We are still in the age where a lot of people have serpentine versions of dragons. Mm -hmm. This concept of worm is very regularly used. Uh, The way it's described is uh, with an Anglo-Saxon term that means to bend. So it's supposed to be a very flexing dragon. Cool. And has venomous bite and poisonous breath. You also have the lindworms in Germanic countries, which are, again, wingless serpentine dragons. Fafnir is a famous form of this in North mythology and is known for having a hoard of treasure, uh, which was cursed very much in like the dragon sickness in The Hobbit. Yeah, yeah. That those who take the dragon's treasure suffer later on. Sea serpents were also a common form of dragon in Nordic mythology. Jormungandr was often considered among these dragons and are also limbless and wingless. The world serpent. Yep, due to do battle with Thor at the end of time at Ragnarok. You also got some differently named and like categories of dragons. Like Slavic dragons included alas, which were basically just snakes that became monsters. It was said that a very old snake could transform into this kind of dragon. Mm -hmm. So they're just monstrous dragons. They also could have multiple heads. They also had dracons, once again with a K, that were specifically different and had typically male and female versions, often brother and sister the female was an enemy of mankind. The male was a protector of mankind. Mm. She destroyed their cop- crops. He protected them. She was water-based. He was fiery-based. These are still said to have a snake's body, but often three-headed with wings. Mm-hmm. So re- st- a lot of dragons at this time are still very serpentine. Yeah. They also had another multi-headed one that was called that had multiple names of Smok or Smej or Smej. That was another multi-headed serpentine dragon but often was considered to be Mm four-legged. So this was another one a little bit closer to our typical picture of a dragon. A lot of Iberian dragons were also winged serpents. One of them was described as having a hypnotizing gaze and was beat by a hero with a reflective shield, a la Medusa. Uh Aha, yeah. So you also see a lot of other monster stories be attributed to a new dragon in a new land. Yeah, we're mixing and matching pieces of different mythologies. Absolutely. And then there are Catalan dragons in northern Spain which were described as enormous serpent-like creatures with four legs and a pair of wings, sometimes with the head of a lion or a bull, you know, or other animals, but those were the two mentioned. Fire breathers and dragon fire is described as all-consuming. They also are described as emitting a fetid odor, which is another thing that 
is kind of like poisonous, toxic. Yeah. That these are just noxious beasts to be around. And so throughout these countries during the Middle Ages, we see the dragons take on more and more of that four-legged, two-winged, long-bodied form from the purely serpent form. And it is during this time, especially during the 11th and 13th centuries, that people really, really are like, no, no, dragons are out there. They're real, especially since most people know them from the Bible. So Mm. they take those stories very seriously and that dragons are actual threats in the real world with lots of bestiary entries just describing them alongside lizards and other animals. Just, yeah, there's cows, there's lizards, there's dragons, and so on and so forth. Many of these different versions of dragons were definitely taking inspiration from each other, taking inspiration from the Mesopotamian dragons, from, you know, other stories of Greek dragons and other areas of of Europe and the Middle Eastern area, like different forms all coming together. So there's no singular for sure origin of what inspired dragons, which is the case for many, many monsters. Right. People have speculated. Crocodiles are often pointed because some areas where stories came from could have had interactions with crocodiles or Nile crocodiles may have ranged more widely than Mm -hmm. they do today. They would have only needed to cross, you know, the Mediterranean to get up to Italy and Greece. So real life giant reptiles could be part of the answer. A lot of people have suspected that just the encounters with, you know, big impressive animals like elephants, like whales is enough to be just inspired to create your own giant monster. Fear of snakes definitely is is a valid thing to turn them into monsters. Sure. And in some of those cases, like talking about Indian Mm -hmm. dragons, that is a place where you get really big, powerful snakes. snakes. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have just said that it might just be the collective and and often present human fear of predators and just Mm -hmm. creating an amalgamation of predators to make the the ur predator yeah. of a dragon which a lot of monsters in mythology are bits and pieces of real life predators or yes. other dangerous animals absolutely this one's got clawed limbs and a snake's body and yep. talons and, and wings yeah. and, yep all that stuff but probably one of the weirdest things about dragons is that they breathe fire and that's another thing people have looked at okay but a why you know where did that idea come from and why is it so prevalent mm mm-hmm. mhm One reason that it probably got so strongly connected to them is when they started to be used as a metaphor for Satan, that the concept of hell being a fiery place or the gates of hell literally being the maw of a fire-breathing monster. Right. Like, that was an early, early depiction of hell. So once dragons got connected, it is very likely that that hell fire... Yeah, that that infernal flame. Exactly. I also saw one thing noting that a lot of times uh, dragons are described as lighting up the sky which they've said might be a reference to Lucifer, whose name means light bringer. Oh, yeah. So being Hmm. given hellish traits might be one of the reasons that they got so uh, entrenched into the dragon mythos. Yeah, yeah. With fire and... Breathing fire, creating fire became a thing with them. Mm. As for why that idea came about, it could just be from sources, you know, that we know fire can be bad and stuff like that. Some people have noted that the idea that dragons often lurk in caves and swamps in desolate places away from civilization, sometimes under lakes and, you know, underwater. Some have linked this to the fact that there are natural gas fields that can burn if they get struck by lightning or if a, a campfire gets left. You can just have burning earth where typically methane is leaking up from the ground. Uh, I did, when I was looking into that, come across the most famous example, which is the Darvaza uh, gas crater which is in Turkmenistan. And it basically it goes back to in 1971, the Soviet Union was looking for oil, found what they thought would be a likely oil field. And while drilling hit natural gas deposits and it, the ground collapsed into a crater and actually caused multiple collapses because the ground was so unstable and it started leaking natural gas methane, which isn't inherently deadly, but it can push out oxygen. And so it can be dangerous, started killing local wildlife. So they decided, all right, well, let's light it on fire, burn away the natural gas, and it'll burn out in a couple weeks probably, and we'll be done with the problem. And it's been burning since then. (laughs) There's a, there's some, I I don't remember the specifics. I think it's a place in Ohio Mm -hmm. that is like an old mining place where there is an underground fire that either was burning or has, is still burning for like a hundred years. Yep. Mm -hmm. So you could definitely have something like that that could 
that could I could see could, that as either the origin help, help inspire uh-huh. this idea. Uh, either the gates to hell, <laughs> sure, or of this is a dragon's lair. Yes, and so, subterranean mm-hmm. creature lives here and makes fire. Another commonly cited inspiration for dragons is fossils. Yep, that comes up a lot. This is a very very regular topic of discussion, and it is both because there is some there are some direct examples of people pointing at fossils and claiming them to be other things. Like we have text mm-hmm. of people saying, this is the bone of a giant. And it was definitely a fossil. Right. You know, that, that is like, yeah, this was like a mammoth bone they found yes. and said, uh, clearly this is the bones of mythical giants. And that's not other mythical creatures. Just something through oral history. We have it written down and it was held in churches as like, right, right. these were giants that were around before the flood. Here is an artifact from the before times. And that happened multiple times, and it's been research in, into this, and we know that people were using fossils as a way to uh, to show evidence of monsters they had already created. Right. So they didn't create it just from this purely, but they had the concept of giants. They found a giant bone and went, obviously... Yeah, this must be it. And this has happened with dragons. Uh, mm-hmm. One example of one of these giants, where they had a, a, a story of a giant in Austria that was said to have killed a dragon that guarded a treasure. And one of the things it did was take the dragon's tongue as a trophy. And they had the dragon's tongue in the church to show it. And it was a swordfish nose. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So there have been times where things, other things, either fossil or just other animals. There's the famous dragon tongues, which were often dragon, uh, shark's teeth. Yeah, fossil shark teeth mm-hmm. were called dragon tongues. One of the most direct ones I found, though, was in, again, in Austria... There's a legend of a lindworm that was hunted, that haunted the area and was devouring people and livestock. Finally, the ruler sent their knights to go destroy the dragon. After many attempts, they finally killed it and they brought back its head to the town to denote their victory. And it was held in the town hall to display it. And in 1582, an artist borrowed the skull to make a sculpture of the dragon that now still sits in the town. And it was a woolly rhinoceros skull. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it there have been times where people have been like, no, no, Dragon Skull. We right. have one right here. That they, Obviously, they're real. Right. That uh, if not fossils being the direct inspiration mm-hmm. for the idea of dragons, certainly used to support the idea of yes. dragons. And so it's probably not that they saw dinosaur bones and went, well, obviously, that right. had to be a giant reptile. Right. Now we can invent mm-hmm. the idea of dragons necessarily. We already had the idea of dragons and then saw something that we could only explain by saying it was a dragon mm-hmm. at that time. Right. Or a giant or whatever yes. other mythical creature. And so the European dragon had taken many, many forms, but starting very serpentine, even though a lot of the very earliest, a lot of Tiamat's children were dragon shaped. So that form yeah. has been there since the beginning, but the popular one seemed to be the serpent for quite some time until slowly they gained limbs and wings Mm -hmm. and became the dragons we know today. And that form of dragon with the long tail, long neck, four limbs and wings has gone on to be extremely popular. Oh, yes. Like, Uh, this is probably the most common one shown in media today and And in recent history. The idea of guarding a treasure Mm -hmm. or or something like that. Having Having a a lair. Having a lair. Those are things that have been carried over and popularized, especially like Dungeons and Dragons dragons. This is what is considered true dragons. If you're not shaped like this, you're not a true dragon in D&D. You get a different name if you're not like that. Um, The fact that they are European dragons creatures of european mythology carries forward into the more modern european mythology with things like lord of the rings absolutely uh, you mentioned the hobbit smaug mm-hmm. is that sort of class is, is one of the modern classic versions yes of that dragon even though the film version takes a different shape the classic one was not described it was just described as a legged winged dragon yeah uh, and a lot of early artwork of smaug yeah uh is Long with yes. four limbs and the wings. The that... animated movie of The Hobbit had that and mm-hmm. also had a beard. Uh, they, you know, yep. they will have a mixture of features. They will often have like ears, you know, so they're not just purely reptilian. They are dragons. Yeah. In the note of Tolkien, in Middle Earth, there are also different kinds of dragons. There are wingless yeah. dragons. There are legless dragons. There are fire breathing dragons and there are cold drakes, non fire breathing dragons. So like 
even in the mythos of Middle Earth, Tolkien included basically the variety of European dragons that existed in real world myths. Yeah. So they have often taken on many forms, but many, many times come back to that four legged, two winged, long bodied. Yes. And we see that in a lot of modern mythology where you'll have different takes on dragons and it usually includes regional differences mm-hmm. and different mm-hmm. shapes. We, we see that happen quite a lot. So now we can wrap up our history discussion. Now that we have kind of the context. We have the baseline. We can start discussing how would we go about evolving a dragon. Now, before we jump in, our magic disclaimer. Yep, this is important. We are dealing with monsters and we are dealing with some of the most fantastical monsters in all of storydom. Dragons have many abilities that it is impossible for creatures in the real world to have because that's just not physically ca- physically possible. Breathing fire. Many of these dragons lived for centuries, having mystic or, or uh, magical blood. Mm-hmm. Many of the things dragons are known for, we cannot evolve. So we will get as close as we can. And when we can get something that elicits those, we will. But we are not going to bend the rules of natural of, selection of biology. And, <laughs> and physical <laughs> law in our real world to make them actually breathe fire or a multi-ton animal take off with two little wings on its back. Like, we have to keep it reasonable. But when it comes to evolving a dragon, there's there's a there's, few... There's so many directions. There's so many directions. There's also a number of challenges. Very commonly cited, the fact that they have six limbs. Yes. With four legs and two wings is a body plan no vertebrate has in our real world. Yeah. So if we want a dragon, if we, if we want to evolve a dragon... That is that this sort of modern classic arms, legs, and wings, we have to come up with a solution to that. We either need to add a pair of limbs or something that is wings without being limbs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I I mean, I definitely have ideas for that, but I wanted to get your first take after all that. I think that if we, so if we want four limbs plus wings... The issue that we run into is that vertebrates have evolved wings three times. Yes. Uh, Birds, bats, and pterosaurs, and every time they have converted the front arms into wings. Yep. So you have back legs plus wings. If we want to evolve, if we want a creature to be able to evolve with two extra appendages that serve as wings, we will need to take inspiration from the other group of animals (laughs) that has evolved wings, insects, who did not convert legs into wings. Yes. But for whom the wings developed from some other pre-existing structure. So we've talked about this on the podcast that insect wings likely evolved from structures that were originally external gills mm-hmm. or sensory structures or something else. Extra parts of the exoskeleton and, and limbs. Like there's one version that it might have been the upper section of one of the legs that fused with the body and became wings. Right, like, right. They, they are their own thing. So we could t- totally, if we want a vertebrate dragon, explore the exaptation mm-hmm. of another structure. Absolutely. Now, coming up with the idea of a structure that sticks off the body and could be vaguely wing-shaped, mm-hmm. uh, there, are, there are different things, but we there are just examples in the real world of stuff that's like this. There sure are. One of which would be display structures. Mm-hmm. We absolutely get animals that have developed sails and big spines that come off the body. But, and this almost feels like cheating, mm-hmm. there are lizards that have gliding surfaces yeah. that are supported by long ribs. Draco lizards. Draco lizards. <laughs> we named them that for a reason. Are lizards that have all the normal limbs and tail appendages and all that. And then their ribs are expanded to support this gliding structure. Even more than that, what it makes me think of is there are gliding reptiles from the Triassic. Yep, I, yep. Think, I think the Kuenosaurids yes. are among this that had a gliding surface very similar to modern Draco lizards, but it wasn't the ribs supporting them. It was a separate set of bones coming off of the ribs. So... Not even the ribs being repurposed and expanded for this, like a cobra hood, but a separate set of bones that developed as part of this supporting your gliding membrane structure. 
which is very much where my mind went. And I very much like that for a couple reasons. One, it gets us the four limbs and wing-like structures. Yeah, we have. We, now we have an, a structure with its own bones. Mm-hmm. It's it's already something we know can evolve readily within natural environments, and it is something that can very easily be modified for aerodynamic purposes because that's already what it's doing. Yes, and making them a squamate makes me very happy because so many of them started as snakes. Yes, and, and while you were going through it, I was like, yeah. So much of the origins of dragons are as snakes or snake-like creatures. Yes. Now, it, it is very tempting to evolve our European dragons from snakes. Mm-hmm. Because that would be very satisfying oh, yeah. to say, yes, the, you, yeah, just straight yeah, up snakes. You are correct. <laughs> but if we want all those appendages, mm-hmm. uh, it is much easier for evolution to act on what is already present yes. than to redevelop all of these additional structures. That being said, if it's lizards, that is already a very snake-like shape. And lizards often do have longer torsos and can have very long tails. Yes, they can. And so you can get this sort of serpentine-like body structure with... Whilst, and, and if we wanted to, since we're making stuff up, we could even say that our dragon ancestors were lizards that were close cousins of snakes. Exactly, yeah. That's what I was thinking is, if we start with close ancestral cousins of snakes, but lizards, gliding has evolved multiple times. Yep, Ar- arboreal mm-hmm. lizards. Uh, the coaniosaurids from the Triassic are not lizards, uh, if, I, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly, but they, they're early lizard-like reptiles. Yes, yes. But yeah, there are tons of groups of, of lizards and lizard-like reptiles have evolved various forms of gliding So you have arboreal habits Mm -hmm. and spend enough generations either falling or jumping out of trees Mm -hmm. and you're developing the selective pressure that allows for flaps of skin on the side of the body to be selected to develop into something of a gliding surface. Precisely. And another thing that evolves very often in the lizard group is limblessness, losing your legs. So we could have serpentine descendants of this group. Yeah. So we could have lindworms and the mainline group that leads to the bigger, beefier, four-legged dragons. Yes. And I do like, while we were going through the history, I do like the idea of evolving drag European dragons as a clade, mm-hmm. as a group, a lineage of organisms that gives us the ability to have different branches that then specialize in different ways. Yep, yep. Especially if you already developed those gliding extra trunk bone, you know, you know rib bones mm-hmm. before reducing your legs, then you could still have wing-like structure, even if you're not using it the same way. Right. Maybe now it's a display mm-hmm. structure or something like that. But you have those those dragon wings, even as you start to become more and more serpentine and just legless lizard. Yes. And I like that from there, if we say that this was a Triassic origin near snakes somewhere within the lizard family tree developed as something where those side appendages gave rise to a gliding structure and then that general body shape gives rise to a bunch of diversity we could have some that take to underground Mm -hmm. and either lose those gliding structures or keep them as like a retractable foldable display structure we still have them but we're we're you know too big now to actually glide with them we have, uh, they can, some of them can stay in trees mm-hmm. and continue to glide. Uh, they could even potentially get pretty big yes. with bigger gliding surfaces. So we could have pterosaur sized things. Yeah. And if we want, we could even have descendants that get quite big, mm-hmm. right? Monitor lizard size, Komodo dragon size. They might not be gliding anymore. No. But they could still have those as a display structure. Yes. Or as. Uh, for for uh, displaying to each other or as a making yourself look really big mm-hmm. and scaring the the image of like a monitor lizard like reptile that you'll and you will see this with monitor lizards especially smaller ones that will rear up yes on their hind legs the notion of like a water monitor type lizard rearing up on its hind legs and then spreading out those big display wing like display structures yep yep is a very cool thought yep 
all the other thing I like about that is it puts all of our dragons in the Mesozoic, right? Which is a very satisfying place to have a bunch of different dragons. It is. It is when dragons, if if they were to walk <laughs> our planet, should walk our planet. I also like a lizardy group because they they also can have horns. Like we have lots of armor, oh, yeah, ornamentation yep. all over. They also can be venomous. Yes, like. A lot of, and it's because a lot of the dragon features are snake features, which are lizard features. Yes. So, so like, it, we're, we're just, this is recursive. Yeah, it's. We're going back to real life origins of these animals. Precisely. Dragons have more in common with lizards than they have just about anything else. <laughs> when you go back through their history. And it's because, yeah, they were inspired by a very specialized group of lizards. So, so I, yeah. I love the idea that these are a Triassic, Triassic ancestors that give rise to a Draconidae mm-hmm, mm-hmm. family. Exactly, yes. That then has branches, uh, big, big examples. We could even have aquatic members. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Members. And now we've got, add that to our Sea Serpents mm-hmm, episode mm-hmm. Uh, from back in our, our Sea Monsters year. Well, and I, I like if it's you know a very diverse, successful group, because then you can have multiple forms. Like, you can have multiple legless members, some that are swimming, some that are also subterranean, some that are still arboreal. And then you have that moment of like, oh, it's one of the swimming dragons. Legs or no legs. Right. Because both of them swim great. Which is <laughs> which is very funny to think about because as you were just kind of getting at, really what, and it feels like cheating. Mm-hmm. Because really what we're doing is just taking all things that lizards already do but here with yep. with this display so just slash gliding glue structure, glue these on, just like an old dinosaur movie. <laughs> we're just like gluing these pieces putting on, putting clothes on your pets. And yes. We're just we're velcroing these wings. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is just a clade of animal, a lineage of animals that develops into these different niches mm-hmm. and structures. Uh, now, venomous, you know, venomous uh, as a as a feature. I don't know what the thoughts are on. The ancestor between snakes and and their closest lizards. Uh, most, well, especially some recent mm-hmm. molecular studies suggest that there's a decent chance that the ancestors of snakes were venomous, or at least had the potential for exactly. venom. Which is what I thought. So if this is a near snake group of lizards, we can very easily wrap venom in there. Which could also give us an avenue to at least, if not do fire breathing. Mm-hmm. But... Many of them breathed poison or breathed venom. Yeah. Like many of them, it wasn't fire, but it was my breath is deadly. Yes. Which is is one of those, like from a storytelling perspective, serves the same purpose. So you can see how one got, that fire got replaced that toxic breath. Mm -hmm. Either way, if I breathe on you with either of these dragons, you're dead. Right. Just depends on what killed you. If it's like got spitting cobra type of stuff spitting cobra there are also lizards that will just spit out fluids or Mm -hmm. or excrete fluids uh the horny toads yep yep. that shoot blood out of their eyes is a really famous example of that Uh, which would be nice because there's there are lots of stories of dragon's blood spilt during battle like the one with the the giant that slayed the dragon it Mm -hmm. described that the dragon's blood was spilt and seeped to the ground as a as a goo a black goo yeah which was probably tar deposits historians have said that are in that area you know that they were like this has got to be dragon's blood because what else could it be Uh, like this this black viscous substance has to be the blood of a dragon so dragon blood has often been considered to be abnormal and if you squirt it out of your eyes that's pretty abnormal Another angle for the fire thing, and I because I'm trying to think, how do we get all of our different dragon features? Mm-hmm. I, I love the idea of limbless subterranean. Yes. Dra- that's a thing that we've seen lizards do a bunch of different times. And some of these def- features definitely could be lost. Like if you become a really big, beefy Komodo dragon, you might not spit venom anymore because you don't need that. Right. Not all dragons breathe fire. Well, that's not always the case and you could even have you know today a lot of snakes or limbless lizards will occupy the burrows of other things Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you could have big ones that occupy the burrow this isn't a european thing but like ground sloth burrows yeah yep yep (laughs) that are now home to these big reptilian members of this dragon lineage also they're part of me we don't have animals today that are gliding hunters no really yeah, yeah that's a really good point but I don't see why we couldn't have that mm-hmm. because there are absolutely birds, bats, uh, presumably pterosaurs, insects that hunt on the wing. 
And I do, you know, the, the idea of having branches of this dragon lineage that are predatory, that get you that those talons, mm-hmm. they could be gliding, maybe grabbing stuff out of the air, maybe just gliding to get some distance to, to close in on prey. Well, and I could also see, you know, and we've done this before in Spooky of if we're if we're considering the reputation of these these creatures we evolve mm-hmm. if i if i'm a a ancient person who meets one of the ones that is 15 feet long yep and has a mouthful of sharp you know serrated teeth and big powerful claws to chase me down and and hold down the prey and then i see a smaller one gliding through the air that also has sharp claws for climbing trees I'm not going to go, well, that one's probably harmless. So, yes. Nope, that's a baby it, one, and it's going to go get mom, and I'm out of here. Absolutely gives rise to that. Well, the, uh, the, uh, they fly, they're mm-hmm. here, especially early people who haven't sort of figured out the phylogenetic differences. Exactly, yes. The other thing I was going to say... Or if you've say, just been told stories about yeah, them. absolutely. If you're getting it secondhand. The other thing I was going to say is, if we have dragons in our group that are gliders, I, I'm even perfectly happy to give some of our lineages enough maneuverability in those appendages Mm -hmm. to get a little bit of, you know, you're moving through the air, especially if you're small, maybe you can even fly uh, properly with that. Right. It's one of those where we've never seen gliding taken that far, but there's no inherent reason you couldn't start getting musculature to move that in a flapping motion. There are modern birds Mm -hmm. that are no, and I think not just birds. Uh, I think there are other predators that will do this, but birds are, are known in some groups for going to the edge of forest fires. Yep, yeah, And catching the fleeing animals. Yes. So when a forest fire breaks out and the rabbits and the squirrels and whatnot are fleeing from it, there are hawks and things that will hang out around the edge of the fire and then swoop down and grab the animals while they're busy running away. Absolutely. Uh, there are, of course, uh, the stories of fire-starting birds. Yeah, that carry a piece of burning branch to spread the fire to a new hunting ground. Right. That This is something that has been observed, uh, not documented yeah, thoroughly, yeah. sort of in our modern scientific, but there's and a lot of stories of them. Uh, eyewitnesses and, like, a, and camera footage of... We just saw this hawk do this right. sort of stuff, so but we don't how, actually know how common that is or if that's... Or how intentional it yeah. is. But it, it's a thing that birds do, and if we have some of our dragons who are in the habit of hanging out near forest fires to catch the fleeing animals... Yeah, that when they smell smoke, they show up <laughs> to yes. start hunting. That could 100% give rise to that myth of, Absolutely. yeah, they're starting fires. They're yes. breathing fire to catch... Uh, to flush out these animals. I really do like that. Because then it's it's just that feeling of like, listen, no one knows what start the, started the fire. All I'm saying is there's, there's always dragons there's around. always dragons there. Every time the field catches on fire. <laughs> I'm not a mathematician, but one plus one equals two. <laughs> We're seeing a lot. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. And we could have our sea serpents of this lineage that are convergent with mosasaurs, mm-hmm. which are already yeah. presumably closely related to snakes. Absolutely. That potentially. That's already out there the other thing that stands out about these dragons that i i'm I'm sort of hooked on thinking about is that prevalence of them having lairs yes and guarding treasure yes and i have thoughts about the treasure go i also do but go right ahead i've been talking a lot uh the first thought i had when i first started making the connection of i'm pretty sure these are gonna be squaw mates and maybe snakes there are definitely snakes that do this and there are you know lizards they just don't do the cool surrounding that guard their eggs absolutely and i would love if this group had parental care and was dedicated print that that's just a feature of this group like crocodilians where there's not a single bad croc parent like yeah every single croc we have around today defends the nest avidly sometimes defends other people's young other uh, uh females young after they're hatched yeah. Are, they're all good parents. And there are snakes today mm-hmm. that are good parents, that guard their eggs, that guard their young. Yeah. There are pythons that will coil around their eggs and shake. That was the sh- mental image. Shiver to keep them warm. That gave me the idea of a pile of golden, of yellow, yes. shiny eggs that this, this dragon has coiled itself around to protect. Yeah. Also, the idea of them gathering stuff and hoarding it 
could easily be taking food mm-hmm. or nest building materials back again, now pulling inspiration from birds. Yep, yep. Also, also, the idea that they have these big wing-like structures in some of them that are clearly for display purposes. So we have animals among this group that ha- are already doing displays, and in a lineage where display is already common, it is not uncommon to see escalation of display. Absolutely, yeah. And in birds, it is not uncommon at all for part of their courtship display to be making a pretty nest. Yes. Uh, bower birds are especially famous for this, where they gather shiny things mm-hmm. and make a nest, make a display that functions both as I'm showing this off to potential mates and this is where the eggs will go. Yes. So the idea of having certain members of this dragon lineage that are good parents, that are guarding their eggs, and then also maybe like going into town mm-hmm. and stealing food. Yep, yep. Which and has if, very nice, the coming in and, and stealing the livestock. Yeah, yeah, and if they're big. But yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, if you've got a Komodo dragon coming into town, yeah. hide your pets and livestock. And it, and it grabs little goats and mm-hmm. drags them back out, and it's hoarding those things. That can get us that. Yeah, because, yeah, once again, it feels almost like cheating. Mm-hmm. Because, and, it, uh, and uh, once again, again, because dragons, so much of dragons are inspired by real world animals. Absolutely. Uh, real world animals have layers. Yes. That's a thing, that's they, a thing do. they do. <laughs> they have dens, they uh, have nests. That's just normal. Uh, the other reason I really like the the parental care <laughs> aspect, and this is just very much a personal note for myself, because I am always rooting for the dragon in any media ever. Oh, for sure. Always. That's the hero. And if we make it golden precious eggs, that makes the dragon slayer the bad guy. Oh, that's true. Yep. Yeah. And now those are the, the, the those are the babies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If there's a Voltaire song all about that. A, a person <laughs> sent to slay a dragon, find out it was just fighting to protect, protect its young. Yep. No, I I very much appreciate it. Yeah. If you're a dragon slayer, you're a jerk. <laughs> you are a nest raider. Uh, but it also would be a cool concept of like there is uh, uh, beliefs about the eggs of like they're considered delicacies or they're medicinal. Right, Even right, right. if they aren't gold themselves, they're as good as gold. They're worth their weight in gold. It may be just because of the reputation of, like, yeah. they gained a reputation because they are hard to get, and eggs are good. Eggs are a good thing to have. It's good food. And then it gained this notoriety or something. Also, we have that angle, you know, especially comparing them to crocs. Crocs are very long-lived. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, don't get sick very often. Yes, yes. So you could absolutely have that where it was like, yeah, that this, this big dragon creature lives for decades and decades doesn't seem to get sick clearly there's some medicinal use to the blood or the eggs or something oh well especially if you have like you mentioned reusing dens if you have that like this first one built a den and then when it died a new one moved in or its offspring like you know there are there are i know there's at least a couple lizards where it's like multiple generations will hang out together Mm -hmm. it's not common but there are some groups that do that well and there are some places especially in northern latitudes Mm -hmm. like europe uh, much of Europe is where snakes will return to the same hibernacula, the same area for mating and reproducing year after year. Yes. Often because that's one of the few places in the region that is available for it. Mm-hmm. But like if you have that, well, as far back as you know, my grandfather and his father all have stories of a dragon in that cave. We don't realize that it's been a different dragon. Yes. But there has always <laughs> been a dragon there. And we send people to slay it and it comes back to life. Uh, you know, it, it cannot be killed. Uh, just that they are, you know, prevalent and they are reusing layers for generations or new members would be a yes. cool concept. Uh, the last thing that comes to my mind uh, is I know that it is very tempting, especially since we are evolving a diverse mm-hmm. lineage that has all these different habits. Uh, dragons are often very big. Yes. And... Uh, while it is difficult to imagine a bulky lizard-like body with four limbs and, and all that stuff truly moving through the air, if we are leaning on the display structure thing, I don't see any reason why these dragons can't get really big. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. It, it's like a, I've definitely been... If you get massive but you still have things that look like wings, we're going to still call them wings, and there's going to be folklore about you flying right. with them. Because we see that today with animals of people still saying, well, you know, an earwig will use that claw to burrow into your... Nope, that's right. not why they're called that. That's not it. But 
when you look <laughs> at it, you go, well, I can only come to a couple conclusions of what you're going to use that on me for. And the notion of combining a bunch of our reference points here, the notion of like a Spinosaurus right? sized or shaped member of this lineage where instead of a sail on the back, it's these this double appendage mm-hmm. on the back that has been made into this big fan like yeah, these oh, these foldable fans that they yeah can that spread. It, I, I imagine it could fold like a a bat's wings mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you put it away like a peacock tail yes right, so yeah we keep this tucked away until it is display time and then you're displaying they could even be big herbivores oh yeah no that, that are point. just displaying across the plains. Uh, And they have adapted towards, you know, grazing or whatnot, but they've got this big structure on the back that is displaying across the plains. Well, then that may, now, now I'm picturing it like a big herbivorous one that's still horned and puts that display up when it's trying to fend off a predator and intimidate. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you're, you're like a big triceratops, you're you're a big ceratopsian dragon, basically. That's very cool concept. Yes. Yes to that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, another thought on the fire note. We're bouncing all over <laughs> yep, the place. Yep, yep. Uh, large reptiles living in northern latitudes are going to need to hang out in warm places. Yes. So it would also make tons of sense that they're hanging out in places that are geothermally mm-hmm. active. So you have geysers and you have volcanic activity and that's where they live and that's where they keep their lairs because yep, yep. their nests need to stay nice and warm. So that could be another link to Absolutely, that primordial uh, heat and fire and the gates of hell yes. because literal volcanoes are here yep yep yeah no absolutely well and the other nice thing with you know the european dragons is that they they also range all the way down like as long as they are stories can make their way up <laughs> yes <laughs> there's plenty of warm areas that they could be hanging out in and being getting real big <laughs> yes and this still leaves us with plenty of opportunity for our lizards to do the thing that lizards have done dozens of times and completely lose their limbs, mm-hmm. wings included, and become constrictors. Yep. we Absolutely, you could just still have those. Yes, yeah, of course. This can still evolve into an Indian python yes. of an animal. We can, we can have Jormungandr. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, dragons. We can have giant serpents. And I also like that because we are combining, perhaps a little bit enthusiastically so, but we are combining features, right? The generalized lizard body shape, the limbless lizard body shape, and the ability to move through the air all of which are often associated with radiations Mm -hmm. and diversification through Earth history, all of which could easily then give rise to a diversity of species of that shape. Absolutely. Absolutely. So our speculative European dragons originated from, let's put them in the Triassic. That that makes the most sense. Absolutely. Uh, Cuneosaurids, the ones with the extra appendages, incidentally, found in North America and Europe. All right. So fantastic. Perfect. Um, So something like that, but within true lizards, uh, perhaps closely related to the origins of snakes that were gliders Mm -hmm. that like those developed extra rods of bone on the side of the body that developed to eventually support gliding structures that then instead of getting locked into that lifestyle like a lot of those early triassic gliders diversified yes became unusually successful so the earliest dragons would have been small tree climbing gliding reptiles and then as they became uh, unexpectedly successful and diversified into large forms and short limb and limbless forms and swimming in subterranean forms yeah became one of the major groups that also would have spread out into the different regions yes all while often holding on to that now fairly well-developed secondary set or tertiary set Mm -hmm. of appendages that could be used for display structures, gliding in certain forms, covering your eggs. Yeah, absolutely. Keeping your balance while you're going after prey, Mm -hmm. navigating down. All the things that wings and wing-like structures can be used for. Yes. And then giving rise to... A diversity worthy of the grand mythos of European dragons. Who are who are protecting layers and guarding nests and 
raiding food and, and, and being blamed for setting fires yes. and things like that. Ooh. Some of which may be venomous. Some of which may be venomous or or spit mm-hmm. uh, uh, poison or just have really bad breath. Yeah, yeah. But absolutely. Komodo dragons are mm-hmm. famous for their really bad bites. Yep, yep. I'm very happy with it. This is very cool. You know, it's we've done this a few times in Spooky where we come upon a group that there are so many ideas that we end up doing all of them. Yep, yep. yep. The idea of dragons as a clade, as as a, a diverse lineage of reptiles within Squamates, uh, which, uh, absolutely Squamates. Mm-hmm. Yes, bring on <laughs> all the Squamates. Uh, oh man, a few of them could even have developed those display structures into smaller uh, narrower versions that have like eye spots on them. Oh yeah, like butterfly wings mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. can give you the multi-headed yes appearance. Mm-hmm. Of, oh, that's cool. I very much like that. That's a cool idea. Absolutely, yeah. That are that are purely display now and specialized for a a, a, a mimicry. Yeah. So it, so the, it looks like there are multiple dragons there. But could also for sure lead people to go, whoa, that one has well, three heads. And especially if you have like a, a widened crest on your your actual head that, yeah. so that each one is just a fan of color and eye spot. And it's just like, ah, I don't know. I'm just going to leave it alone. It's eh, eh, right, right, right. Weird. <laughs> uh, I feel like we could continue to add ideas to this. Oh, yeah. Uh, forever. But let's not. I think we can we can settle on uh, this group of dragons <laughs> as yes. our solution this this family or order of dragons yes i'm i'm very satisfied with it very cool so that is our first dragon that's our european dragons listeners uh, if you have further ideas about sp- a speculative evolution with european dragons or want to add ideas mm-hmm. to our now lineage of dragons please go ahead and uh, do so there will for sure be conversations going on in our Discord. 100%. Find us on social media and so on. If you are so inspired as to draw art of any of these creatures. Sure. Sometimes we get fan art. We, we love it. Love getting fan art. We lo- We have often said that we don't actually know what our creatures look like until someone else draws it. And we go, there it is. Yes, that's the one. You did it. Because that uh, it, we don't have an actual visual image in our brain most of the time. So if you do decide you want to draw it, by all means, and if you want to share, you can send us fan art either through the email. There's also a page for it uh, on the Discord yep. where you can submit it. If you're cool with us sharing it and posting it on our fan art page of our website, please let us know. And if you would like us to post it, let us know how to credit you or tag you. Yes. So we welcome absolutely any piece of fan art please 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 it's it is my favorite part of spooky personally <laughs> i love getting to see the creatures it is so much fun we've been looking forward to doing dragons uh it was kind of an, an inevitable choice after last year we did yes. dungeons and dragons and we did a lot of stuff found in dungeons <laughs> yes <and> now <laughs> here are our dragons there are more episodes of Spooky to come. Like we said, every Saturday in October, there will be a new episode of Spooky with more dragons. Absolutely. So stay tuned. Find out what dragon we'll be looking at next. And then don't forget, we have a live stream November 11th. Find out details on our website. We'll be talking all things Spooky and Speculative Evolution there once we're done with the dragons. Yes. But for now, have a spooky week. It's super effective. <laughs> I'm bookending. I have a reference at both at both sides. I did find one reference to dragons being uh, a tool to inspire awe and the power of nature, which made me think of your take on dragon types often being connected. Oh yeah, to that. yeah, yeah. And this is a little uh, tangent that I didn't get to go on in this episode. But dragon type—the thing that unites dragon types in Pokemon more than anything else—is that they look like dragons. Mm-hmm. And that they're super powerful and rare and typically associated with forces of nature. Yes. The very, very cool dragon-y stuff. I did see that mention about real dragons, that they likely were a tool for... You need to respect the majesty and power of nature, so they are associated with powerful, natural yeah. things. All right, there we go. We got, we got to talk about Pokemon. <laughs> so, ooh, okay. All right, oh, good. good. <laughs> What's well, incomplete episode? <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. 
You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.